Hello, friends and supporters. This is Jeremy Ryan from Defending Wisconsin Political Action Committee. Unfortunately, I'm still recovering uh, from some dehydration issues, and uh, I expect to be fully recovered tomorrow. So today I decided to work on a little bit different of a project than covering the protests. I'm reporting from my apartment right now. As you can see behind me, right there is the Capitol. I only live a few blocks away. I can see it uh, from my... Uh, from my bedroom window every morning and from my balcony. Uh, I wanted to go through Senate Bill 11. Now this is only part of the final budget and repair plan that will be voted on. And uh, this is uh, very disturbing. I decided to completely toss away all the union elements and do a report on how it affects everyone who is not unionized, um, who makes less than $500,000 a year. And so, uh, I'd like to take this time now to, uh, to go ahead and read that report so that everyone can know exactly what is in this bill, the exact wording, and why it would affect them even if they are not unionized. Introduction. This is not a full analysis of the bill. This is an attempt to identify several parts of Senate Bill 11, all parts which will be passed if the budget and repair bill is passed, as I am a concerned citizen. I then explain below the exact quotations copied and pasted from Senate Bill 11 and why they affect you. This does not cover education, which will come in another separate video, nor does it cover any union-related portions of the bill. This covers why any non-union citizen of Wisconsin who makes less than $500,000 a year, and even those who make more, should be concerned. Please feel free to share this and any portion thereof. I simply that ask that if you exchange it, you get one person to sign the pledge to petition for recall at www.defendingwisconsin.org. And if you really like the work that we've done, uh, please make a donation. So the first point, uh, this is more of a minor one. Uh, it's in uh, subsection 13.8, except as provided in paragraph B or C, Every building structure or facility that is constructed for the benefit of or use of the state, any agency, board, or commission, or department, the University of Wisconsin Hospital Clinics Authorities, the Fox River Navigational System Authority, the Wisconsin Quality Home Care Authority, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, or any local professional baseball park district covered under subchapter 3 of chapter 229 if the construction is undertaken by the Department of Administration on behalf of the district shall be in compliance with all ap applicable state laws, codes, and regulations, but the construction is not subject to ordinances or regulations of the municipality in which the construction takes place, except zoning, including without limitation because of enumeration ordinances or regulations relating to materials used, permits, supervision of construction or installation, payments or permit fees or other restrictions. So basically they can do crap jobs in building their buildings and because Walker will be gone by the time the structural problems are realized, costing us more money. But that's okay because he won't be there. I don't buy it myself. Municipalities have ordinances for a reason. Certain municipalities require certain structural differences from others. This seems like a way to do cheap work at a cheap price. But more than anything, it simply shows that Walker wants the DOA to have full control over absolutely everything. Um, now this is the Legislative Fiscal Bureau part. There is created a bureau to be known as the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, headed by a director. The, f the Fiscal Bureau shall be strictly nonpartisan. Well, we all know that's not going to happen. And shall at all times observe the confidential nature of research requests received by it. However, with the prior approval of the requester in each instance, the Bureau may duplicate the results of its research for distribution. Subject to Section 230.35, the director of the or the director's designated employees shall at times without notice have access to all state agencies, the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics Authorities, and the Wisconsin Aerospace Authority, the Health Insurance Risk Sharing Plan Authority, the Lower Fox River Remediation Authority, the Wisconsin Quality Home Care Authority, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, and the Fox River National System Authority, 
and to any books, records, or documents maintained by such agencies or authorities and relating to their expenditures, revenues, operations, and structures. So basically, this means that Scott Walker can target his enemies within the state with mounds of paperwork and call it nonpartisan. Quorum. A majority of the membership of a board constitutes a quorum to do business, and unless a more restrictive provision is adopted by the board, a majority of quorum may act in a manner within its jurisdiction of the board. This subsection does not apply to actions of the Government Accountability Board, the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics Board, or the School District Boundary Appeal Board. Another section, Agencies and Employees to Cooperate. All state agencies and authorities created under Subchapter 2 of Chapter 114 and Subchapter 3 of Chapter 149 and under Chapters 52, 231, 233, 234, 237, 238, and 279, and their officers and employees shall cooperate with the Secretary and shall re comply with every request of the Secretary relating to his or her functions. You know, these both just show how much power Scott Walker and the Department of Administration want to have. Now, this is a big one. Uh, 16.896, sale or contractual operation of state-owned heating, cooling, and power plants. Notwithstanding subsection 13.48 and 16.705, the department may sell any state-owned heating, cooling, and power plant or may contract with a private entity for the operation of any such plant with or without solicitation of bids for any amount that the department determines to be in the best interest of the state. Notwithstanding subsection 196.49 and 196.80, no approval or certification of the Public Service Commission is necessary for a public utility to purchase or contract the operation of such a plant, and is such and any such purchase is considered to be in the public interest and to comply with the criteria for certification of a project. So basically, this is where Governor Walker could legally, if the bill passes, sell our power plants for a single dollar. He could also pay somebody, uh, maybe say his uh, second largest contributors, the Koch brothers. Um, he could pay them whatever he wanted out of state funds to maintain such facilities or to operate such facilities. Now, with that being said, they wouldn't even have to buy it. It could still be ours. But we could pay a lot more for our energy than what we're paying now, simply because it costs more to operate the facilities. Why? This would be an extreme financial kickback to the Koch brothers. Now, this is medical assistance. In this subsection, medical assistance includes any program operated under this subchapter. Uh, let's skip down to where it actually says what they can do, what this authority gives them. The department may promulgate rules to do any of the following. Require cost sharing from program benefit recipients up to the maximum allowed by federal law or waiver of federal law. Authorize providers to deny care or services if a program benefit recipient is unable to share the costs to the extent allowed by federal law or waiver. Modify existing benefits or establish various benefit packages and offer different packages to different groups of recipients. Revise provider reimbursement models for particular services. Mandate that program benefits recipients enroll in managed care. Restrict or eliminate presumptive eligibility. To the extent permitted by federal law, impose restrictions on providing benefits to individuals who are not citizens of the United States. Set standards for establishing and verifying eligibility requirements. Develop standards and methodologies to ensure accurate eligibility determinations and redetermine continuing eligibility. Reduce income levels for purposes of determining eligibility to the excess extent allowed by federal law or waiver and subject to limitations under paragraph C. Now this is way too much power for one man to have over medical assistance. Much of the Medicaid is regulated on a state level, so federal laws wouldn't actually protect from a near elimination. Do people abuse the system? Yes. But there are also many who need it, and they would literally die if they had to pay into their Medicaid or were denied treatment because they could not pay in. It is hard enough as it is, it, it's hard enough as it is working with medical assistance. There was a time when I myself was on medical assistance, and all that, though that time has thankfully come and gone, what most people don't realize is this is already a very hard system to work with and needs increases, not cuts. 
Another one, the department shall submit an amendment to the state medical assistance plan or request a waiver of federal laws related to medical assistance. If necessary, to the extent necessary to implement any rule promulgated under paragraph C, if the Federal Department of Health and Human Services does not allow the amendment or does not give the waiver, the department may not put the rule into effect or implement the action described in this rule. The department shall request a waiver from the Secretary of the Federal Department of Health and Human Services to permit the department to have in effect eligibility standards, methodologies, and procedures under the state medical assistance plan or waivers of federal laws related to medical assistance that are more restrictive than those in place on March 23, 2010. If the waiver does not receive federal approval before December 31, 2011, the department shall, in, it shall reduce income levels on July 1, 2012 for the purposes of determining eligibility to 133% of the poverty line for adults who are not pregnant and not disabled to the extent permitted under 42 U.S.C. 1396A. If the department follows the procedures under 42 U.S.C. 1396A, using a procedure under Section 227.24, the department may promulgate a rule under Paragraph C as an emergency rule. Notwithstanding, the department is not required to provide evidence that promulgating a rule under Paragraph C as an emergency rule is necessary for the preservation of the public peace, health, safety, or welfare, and is not required to provide a finding of emergency for a rule promulgated. Notwithstanding 227.24 and to an emergency rule promulgated under this paragraph remains in effect until whichever of the following occurs. The effective date of the repeal of the emergency rule, the due date on which the permanent rule promulgated under takes effect. Basically, this is saying that they will try to get the federal government to comply with new rules proposed to Medicaid, but if they cannot, they will make an emergency rule of some sort, and will also make the income levels lower to get on Medicaid. The income levels now are barely enough to cover an independent individual health plan if the people on it contributed every single dollar they made into it. So basically, if your employer doesn't offer insurance and you cannot get Medicaid because you make too much, which isn't much, then you have then you better hope you didn't don't get sick or worse, a terminal illness. Now, coming from me, someone who's survived bone cancer, lung cancer, and a cardiac condition, this is uh, pretty serious. Now, another one, the department shall establish a system of payment to pharmacies for legend and over-the-counter drugs provided to recipients of medical assistance that has financial incentives for pharmacies who perform services that result in a savings to the medical assistance program. Under this system, the department shall establish a schedule of fees that is designed to ensure that any incentive payments made are equal to or less than the discounted savings unless otherwise provided by the department by a rule promulgated under subchapter 2M. The department may discontinue the system established under this subsection if the department determines after performance of a study that payments to the pharmacists under the system cannot exceed, exceed the documented savings under the system. Now, the Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin made significant contributions to Walker's campaign. This is just another way he's paying back the people who paid him. But notice how they already expect a problem, and they say they can discontinue it if the payments exceed the savings. Why would they put that if they didn't expect that to already happen? But since when have pharmacists have been able to best choose what medications I do or don't take? Isn't that a doctor's job? This will be continued in part two. Uh, please watch part two, folks.